This is Devin Butterfield with Shane Shilton, and our research project was on protein energy malnutrition. Protein energy malnutrition, or PEM, can be defined simply as an inadequate protein intake and can be broken down into three different conditions quasiorcor, marasmus, and marasmic. In our research, we'll be focusing on the first two disorders. PEM has many risk factors associated with it. Some of these risk factors include countries with a high birth rate, focus on subsistence farming, overused soil drought and desertification, pets and diseases, poverty, and a low protein diet, along with political instability. Pictured here is a map of the world and its malnutrition hotspots. In this image, we can see that Africa, and specifically Sub-Saharan Africa, consists of most countries with 15% acute malnutrition. However, it is important to note that all of Africa is suffering to an extent from malnutrition, which leads us into our next discussion of PEM in Africa. PEM in Africa. The term protein energy malnutrition has been adopted by the World Health Organization in 1976, and according to the World Health Organization, 49% of the 10.4 million deaths occurring in children younger than 5 years in developing countries are all associated with PEM. Highly prevalent in developing countries among children, PEM focuses on infants and people under the age of 5 years old. First, we will look into quasi-orcor and its history and its emergence into medical health today. Cecily Williams, a British nurse, had introduced the word quasiorcor first to the medical language in 1933. The word is originally taken from the Ga language in Ghana and is used to describe the sickness of weaning. In literal terms, the sickness the baby gets when the new baby comes. As we discussed, quasiorcor is a protein deficiency malnutrition disorder and it develops in children and infants after 18 months. Also it develops in many poor countries due to the lack of food. Very, it is also very rare in children of the United States and only in seen in cases of severe child abuse and severe neglect. Next, let us discuss our body's protein needs as are seen in this table. The RDA requires that infants between the ages of 0 and 6 months are required to have 0.52 grams of protein daily. This number increases to 1.5 after 1 year and to 1.1 between the ages of 1 and 3. A decline occurs from ages 4 to elderly which shows that protein is of vital importance to the development of infants. Causes of quasiorcor. As we discussed, protein deficiency is the main cause of quasiorcor, but also there is much research explaining there is a combination of energy and micronutrition deficiency as well. This disease tends to develop in infants and children after a mother weans her child from the breast milk, replacing milk with a diet in high carbohydrates, especially starches, but deficient in protein. With the disorder, there is a deficiency of one of several types of nutrients, including iron, folic acid, iodine, selenium, and vitamin C. Some of the effects of quasiorcor can be seen in this picture. Edema, a swelling of adipose tissue, mainly in the abdominal region, can be noticed in this image. Also, other side effects are psychomotor changes, stunted growth, and muscle wasting. The second type of protein energy malnutrition is called marasmus. Marasmus is a protein energy malnutrition which is characterized by calorie and energy deficiency. Marasmus develops prior to the first year of life. It is important to note the difference between quasiorcor and marasmus. As previously stated, quasiorcor is characterized by moderate energy deficiency, but severe protein deficiency. This is an important distinction because marasmus is characterized by both severe energy deficiency as well as protein deficiency. Marasmus is caused by severe malnutrition and inadequate food absorption. Here we see the pathway. Protein calorie deficiency leads to an increase in plasma cortisol. This can lead to growth retardation and a lack of fat deposited in the liver. So why is PEM important? Well, with the exception of Western society, it's one of the largest nutritional issues around the world. Why is it not an issue in the United States? Well, just look around. We live in abundance. We have nutritional education, we have money, and we have resources. While we fight obesity in America, others starve. Efforts to address PEM. Well, protein biofortified sorghum. Sorghum is a staple crop of Africa, especially in dry, arid climates. This is a potential solution in addressing PEM. By putting protein in the sorghum, 
which is a staple crop of many sub-Saharan African countries, we can combat the shortage of protein within the diet. This was found in our research. Now we have a brief interview with Dr. Chilton, a professor of physiology and pharmacology at Wake Forest School of Medicine, and in one of his many focuses of research is growth and development. He has been to Africa many times, including South Africa and Sudan, and Dr. Chilton has experienced and combated PEM firsthand and has conducted extensive research on the issue. Um, Dr. Chilton, I'm just going to ask you a couple questions uh, about malnutrition in uh, Africa. Um, why is malnutrition such an issue in Africa, and in uh, particular, um, protein energy malnutrition? Well, Africa is a very unstable place, and, and, and many of the roots of its unstable nature really arose out of the colonialization that came out of, of Europe and, and kind of the voids that were left after the Europeans left. But, but again, there's, there's warfare, there's been genocide, uh, there's been tribal unrest. Uh, there are really difficult situations that make sustainable agriculture incredibly difficult. Uh, the substance, it's a combination of many factors, uh, uh, but, but again, certainly war and, and, and instability uh, left by the void uh, of colonialization was, has, has played a, a very, very important role. Okay, and um, just kind of talking about crops, uh, you hear about sorghum and the role it plays in malnutrition in, in Africa. It's uh, one of their main crops. Uh, and in particular, in dry and arid climates, um, why is this uh, crop uh, such a key aspect of malnutrition? Well, there's sorghum, there's milly mill, and there's maize, and, and those are really the three different um, uh, food staples that one sees. Uh, uh, most of malnutrition in Africa is not due to a not having enough calories, but it's simply the type of calories. Um, uh, sorghum, milly mill, and maize typically is about 90% carbohydrate, uh, 7 to 8% protein, 2% um, fat. Um, if you, you know, if you think about that your brain mass, uh, uh, dry mass is almost 50% fat, 50% lipid, if you think about that the primary fatty acid in your brain that makes up that lipid is a fat called docosahexaenoic acid, and you're feeding children uh, diets with 2% fat, uh, it, it, it's really going to be quite difficult to, to, to have uh, brain development in a way that's not punishing the cognitive development and developmental disorders. If you think about the fat that controls the immune system, uh, arachidonic acid, really quite difficult to imagine a properly formed immune system in the absence of, of such fat. 7% uh, protein, when, when you're talking about energy protein malnutrition, 7% protein is simply not going to do. So growth stunning is going to be a natural result. So growth stunning, uh, brain uh, uh, disorders and, 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 and retardation of cognitive function, uh, uh, a retardation or the, the, the underdevelopment of the, the immune system are all critical issues that result from sorghum, milling, mill, and maize. Well, Dr. Chilton, I know you're a very busy man. I uh, appreciate the time that you've uh, taken out of your schedule today uh, for this interview. Um, I've just got one final question. Um, what do you think some of the important uh, steps globally and nationally um, that people should take to address malnutrition in Africa and, um, and protein, uh, protein energy malnutrition? Um, uh, you know, they talk about biofortified uh, sorghum and, and different, you know, biological steps we could take, uh, genetic steps we could take. Um, what are some of the steps you think we should take globally and nationally? Well, we, we really have to have a very good understanding of the, of the needs of the human, and in particular of the needs of the genes that, that really go into to the development of humans. In this country, for example, uh, 
it's been estimated that 72% of the calories that we take in are not recognized by our hunter-gatherer ancestor gene. So again, we have a form of malnutrition here in the midst of abundance. Uh, similarly in Africa, we have this, this very, very difficult and, 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 and troublesome mismatch of, of the food that is being taken in and the, the food that's necessary to have proper functioning of our, our, our human genome. So we must understand what's necessary for the human genome and human genes in the human genome to function properly and then we must biofortify uh, either the sorghum millimillar maize or we create therapeutic foods or we create ways to get those critical foodstuffs into the food supply. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to our podcast. Tune in next time.